Paso means the pass. These are the foothills of the Rocky Mountains where we live. The beautiful mountains and the sunsets. And there's a little valley that goes through with the Rio Grande flowing through it. And on the other side is Mexico, and that's where the mountains start up again, Sierra Madres. And this pass has been here for many, many, many centuries. People who live here don't realize what an unusual place El Paso is. There's no other place that I know of in the world where a border city, there are two such large border cities together. El Paso, Texas is sort of like the Ellis Island uh, in New York City to the United States from people coming from Mexico. In this community here, the Segundo Barrio, this is the first stopping place for, for uh, people coming from Mexico into the United States. Living in El Paso or living on the U.S.-Mexico border is you have two cultures and two languages living side by side and it really more and more we live here you realize that there is no border. Mexican Americans that are in El Paso came here as refugees trying to escape the war in Mexico during the Mexican Revolution. Uh, my, my great aunt she escaped from one of the federal um, officers with the help of another sister that was Anadelita which were the women fighters in the revolution. The role of El Paso and Juarez in the Mexican Revolution was huge. El Paso and the Segundo Barrio were the gathering place for intellectuals, for writers, for revolutionaries, for exiles, for people that wanted to change Mexico. And you could say that El Paso helped spark the revolution and Juarez had the most important battles of the entire Mexican nation going on. Francisco Madero, he's the, the provisional president of Mexico. He's the guy that recruits people like Pancho Villa and Pascual Orozco as his main generals and his main revolutionaries, going to go and revolt against the government of Porfirio Diaz. Porfirio Diaz is the dictator of Mexico. He's, he's in power for more than 35 years. And what he what he's basically is doing is selling out the country of Mexico to the rich corporations in the United States and France and Europe. And what he does is he goes in and conquers the communities, takes the survivors, on a train down to Yucatan, which is thousands of miles in the south of Mexico, and sells them as slaves. And he did wonders for the rich, but the rest of Mexico lived in, in, in utter poverty. 90% of El Paso was pro-revolutionary. In fact, when the Mexican Revolution starts, everybody crowds to the river. You see these scenes of hundreds of El Pasoans cheering the revolutionaries right in front of a sarco, and, and they were showing their support. Some of them would, would throw coins to them. And the main revolutionary headquarters, they call it La Casita Blanca, uh, was right in front of a sarco where monument number one is now. And that's where Madero and scores of his people that would later become presidents of Mexico. And you see this one very famous picture that you have you know, the who's who of the Mexican Revolution. And all these guys at one point or another had their headquarters in El Paso. And the revolution has a tremendous effect on the cultural life on the city. The El Pasoans went to the rooftops of some of the larger buildings and they would pay from 25 cents to a dollar to watch the revolution live. And they would give you a bench top of the El Paso the Norte Hotel. When there was something that the El Paso spectators liked, they would cheer. It was a macabre sight in a way because people thought that the revolution was just another show, another circus, but it was very real. And actually 10 El Pasoans lose their lives because they get too close to the action. Three days later after that battle ends and Pancho Villa and Madero win, and the whole government of Mexico topples because 
of what happened here in El Paso and Juarez. Bowie High School is very well known throughout the state of Texas. Bowie High School in the middle 40s was very interesting for the fact that uh, it was the beginning of my tenure as a Bowie Bear. I started in 1945 at Bowie, and uh, that was the end of World War II, and a lot of our soldiers, our heroes, uh, were coming back from the war, and uh, they were allowed to attend Bowie High School. And uh, of course, they were grown men by that time. Some of them were up in their 21s, 22 years of age, and we were all maybe 16, 17, all the way up to 18 years of age. But they were given the opportunity to uh, to continue with their schooling. I graduated from Bowie High School in 1949 with a good friend of mine, Rocky Galarza. He always the captain of the teams. He was the most popular guy in, in campus. I remember the history of this barrio, the Segundo Barrio, as seemed though it was just yesterday. And, and uh, the one thing that I remember was sports. I love sports. I love sports then and I love sports now. When I was at about the fifth or sixth grade, I used to admire uh, a quarterback by the name of Rocky Galarza. When I first saw Rocky, I was a young kid. He was a tremendous football player. I mean, Rocky could do anything. He could play baseball. He could play basketball. You named it and, and Rocky could do it. Boxing, God, oh man, you know, golden gloves. He'd be a champion there. And, uh, I just didn't, I didn't know if anyone could whoop Rocky. Uh, the school had a winning year. And, and Rocky then uh, was a very personable, very popular, very handsome young man. I think every girl on every corner used to dream of Rocky Galarza. I mean, because that's the kind of uh, guy he was. Rocky was admired by just about everybody in El Paso. Rocky was one of those guys that you know, today you look at him and you would say, what, what an athlete. I think during Rocky's days, there was probably no athlete in this area, and maybe in Texas, that had the athletic ability than Rocky, because Rocky could do so many things. And I knew the Rocky all the time that we were in high school and afterwards, we, we became good friends. And uh, he was an excellent uh, athlete. When I grew up in El Paso, it was a time of, of when schools were segregated until I became a freshman in 1955. I lived during those times in, in, in two neighborhoods. As a young, young kid, I lived in a place called the Six Hells, which were called the Seis Infiernos, uh, not very far from Armijo Park. Uh, we left from there and, and we moved to a place called El Pojido. El Pojido is an area that, uh, tell you the truth, the police never came through there. Back in those days, they had zip guns and gangs and a uh, tough neighborhood. But uh, one of the things that I remembered vividly is the neighborhood that I lived in, all the guys were so, so, so good and so nice to me. Uh, we were the only black family probably in, in an area of uh, two miles. Uh, that lived in that neighborhood. And at that point, uh, being about three or four or five years of age, I, I learned to speak Spanish. Uh, not the real type of Spanish, but the, the, the local type Spanish that uh, the youngsters and the kids uh, that were my friends taught me. Everybody uh, knew each other. Everybody helped each other. We, we were bonded by, unfortunately, a poverty. And you might not believe this, but some of us think that in, in spirit and uh, in pride, we might have been better off then when, than, than we are now. Uh, as time went on, though, uh, El Paso began to change. I enrolled at Bowie High School in 1955. Because of where I lived and the friends that I, had, that I spent all my time with, it was a natural for me to go to Bowie High School, and at that time, Bowie High School was 7th, 8th, 9th, junior high, all on the same campus. And there I began to uh, excel in sports. It's, it's history and uh, I know one thing, story needs to be told and uh, Josh Lucas. I watched him in other movies and he's a great actor. I thought he was real good. Um, 
I think our players are very pleased and proud. You know, it's a heck of a thing. I, I think you know you've arrived with Don Haskins when you get the opportunity to ride in his GMC pickup truck. And you're not going anywhere in particular. You're absolutely not going anywhere in particular. You're going to see the entire perimeter of, uh, of El Paso County. But, uh, uh, you know, so, some of the greatest uh, conversations probably about uh, basketball ever have happened in that, uh, in that uh, truck piloted by Don Haskins. I think basketball has gone totally back to defense. The old basketball, the Pete Newell, the Henry Iba style of defense first, offense second. The guy I played for, Coach Henry Iba, I put it at the top. I think uh, Coach Iba could have coached anything. A great, great coach. El Paso has is, is always been a great city for basketball. I tell you, basketball has tremendous, tremendous history here. I played in, back in the early 60s when Coach Don Haskins arrived. Basketball was put on the map when uh, Coach came into town. I'm sitting there and I told my wife, I said, you know, hadn't been that many years ago, you know, Nolan helped us unload here in El Paso. Of course, in 1966, they were national champions. That was the only school in the state of Texas probably at any point won an outright national championship. He brought in some players that made El Paso so proud. It's in 1966, the first time ever in NCAA college basketball history, five blacks started against five whites in the NCAA championship game. Don Haskins was that coach that did that. And so when they beat the University of Kentucky, it was a huge upset. It had a very important part in history. I think another th great thing about Haskins, particularly in this day and age, is what he was able to accomplish was accomplished off the beaten path in El Paso, Texas. Don Haskins started what has become, I think, one of the great uh, traditions in, in, in intercollegiate athletics. You can argue that uh, he's more responsible for putting El Paso, Texas on the national map than any other single individual. But not only that, he's a national treasure as well. Basketball at that point was a, became a more of a hotbed for all the young high schools that were being uh, built and they were built on the legacy of what El Paso's UTEP miners had done. I'm from the Mid-Hudson Valley, New York. I'm in high school being recruited in this school, University of Texas El Paso was one of the schools on my list. And we were looking for a guard and uh, one of my assistants kept telling me about Steve Yellen. And we were checking his grades. We are talking about an extremely bright kid. So I came out here to visit. And I've been in love with this place ever since. The summer before I left to college, I went down to New York City and played in some of the city leagues with Nate Archibald, who was an alum of University of Texas El Paso, wore number 14 here. And uh, he was my childhood hero. And, um, I can't tell you what an instrumental person Nate Archibald was in my life when I was in high school. You know, everybody always wants to talk about the great teams. You know, I had four or five losing seasons in the 38. That was two of them, and they were the most enjoyable. On the team that Steve came in with, I had uh, three players, uh, two from here and Steve Ben from New York. Well, you know, when you got guys that are going to do well, you don't worry about. And Steve was one of them. These guys were trying so hard. By the time they got to be juniors, we won over 20 games. And when they were seniors, we won over 20 and went to the NIT twice. Uh, you couldn't work them long enough, hard enough. They never complained. They got better. Fred Reynolds was on that team. Yeah, I met Steve Yelling uh, back in some of 1978, 79 when I first attended UTEP, and um, Steve was a very energetic guy and full of enthusiasm and very competitive basketball players. Probably my junior year in college, I had a chance to meet old Russ Bradbury. He came in as an assistant coach. Uh, I think this was his first job. Tim Floyd brought him in from Chicago, and he said, this guy knows everybody in Chicago, all the coaches, what have you. Uh, <clears throat> I found out real quick the guy could recruit. Uh, he brought Marlon Maxey, who became a first-round draft choice, Johnny Melvin, uh, Ralph Davis, 
Uh, the list goes on and on. Russ Bradbird was exactly uh, what this program needed uh, when he arrived uh, here in El Paso. I think he learned and learned well at the, the feet of, of Tim Floyd, his, his fellow assistant, uh, for several years when Russ first uh, came to El Paso. I was a forward here at UTEP. And um, Russ was big on helping us with our ball handling drills. He did a lot of other things, but his main thing, he helped all the guards. He was able to make me extend my game beyond the free throw line. And it was during that time that we won five consecutive uh, WAC championships. But uh, as good a recruiter as ever was, Tim Floyd was, was really good, and Russ was right there with him. And that's basically how the assistants began to prove themselves as a recruiter. And then when uh, Tim left and uh, went out on his own as, as a head coach, uh, Russ carried on the, the great tradition that, uh, that Tim had, had, had helped uh, Don Haskins continue uh, here in El Paso, uh, recruiting uh, uh, some of the best players that this program has, has ever seen out of, uh, out of Chicago. So uh, uh, Russ Bradbird, uh, his legacy in this program is, is a good and a solid one. You know, Rocky was this guy we all grew up with, this little ladies guy, ran this bar and was real concerned with the neighborhood kids on the streets who had all this sort of angry energy that could be uh, directed in another way. And uh, later Rocky built his own gym for kids to, to, to train in. He was uh, responsible for many, many kids taking off the streets and going to amateur boxing. Rocky ran that bar and behind the place was this grassy yard with this boxing ring there and that's where all those guys used to train and that's where Russ met Ernie. I first met Rocky Galarza. Uh, he was my next door neighbor. I would imagine he lived about five feet away from me. And so I went down to his um, establishment and it was very interesting because it was such a multi-purpose thing. He had his bar and grill and uh, uh, the nightlife, which goes till two o'clock at night. But by five o'clock every afternoon, here would come the kids in and uh, he'd practice with them from five to seven, five to eight, five to eight every evening in the back um, of his, um, his establishment. And then on Saturdays and Sundays as well. During the time that Russ was in, in El Paso's assistant coach at Utah, he found out about the Rocky. He actually used Rocky's gym as an escape from the day-to-day -day rigors of coaching NCAA college basketball. And it was at that time that, you know, he formed a very, very close relationship with Rocky Galarza. And actually, Rocky became his boxing coach. And this was a place where Russ really felt that he could kind of just blend in with all the other young people that were uh, training under the guidance of Rocky Galarza. I believe that there's no person I know of that had as, as a tremendous impact in this particularly in this area, in Rocky Garlarza with kids. And he was always talking about the kids, always trying to save them, especially from these barrios. Rocky's mission was to save the children from all the bad elements, the drugs, the crime, and he wanted to keep them occupied. The, the ones who, who, who fell under Rocky's guidance can to give you some some phenomenal history about Rocky of how he touched their lives. I met uh, Ernie through Rocky, of course, and, but he, Ernie started with Rocky when he was like eight years old. And um, he, he went through a lot of um, um, discipline training, I'll use that term, with Ernie because he was such a, um, a, a, a live wire. Me and Rocky, we met actually through my baseball coach and uh, he introduced me to Rocky and uh, you know uh, from then on you know it was his history we, we just hit it off and uh, Rocky was uh, was just the right coach for me all those beautiful things that Rocky believed in so much carried on to my everyday life uh, it wasn't just in boxing. I, I, I was a hard worker at home, you know, in school. It changed my outlook on a lot of things. It wasn't the same. It kind of humbled me. Boxing humbled me in a sense.
to me, here's this old uh, tradition of, of, you know, fisticuffs, of fighting, and that from that is this camaraderie. And that's the great thing about sports, right, is that, that, that there's this sense of manhood or pleasure of having fought someone. Rocky Galarza made a, 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 a ter terrific impact on, on the kids of uh, the barrio. You, you talk to Ernie and you talk about his family, you talk about his memories of Rocky, you talk about his, his real sense of, of being a paseño, of his sense of being rooted here, and to me it's real holy. I remember when he passed away, he was training me for a minor world title, and I came down here to train. My previous fight with the same opponent, we had fought with another trainer, and I said, there's something missing here. So I came back to Rocky and I said, Rocky, you know, I, I, I can't do it. I need you. I need you. I need your ways again, man. These guys are trying to change me. And I need you to, and me to work together to get to where we want to get. He said, let's do it, son. And we, we trained so hard. It was ah, vivid in my memory, man. And we went in there. The first round, the guy comes out wailing. It was tough. At the end of the round, I managed to drop a beautiful punch in there, and it dropped him a beautiful, beautiful punch. And after that, you know, I dropped him two, three times, and it, they, the referee finally stopped the fight. And you know, for the first time, Rocky could say, from all his hard work, that he had his world champion, because that was his dream. It was a world title that we had, and we beat a very worthy opponent and uh, soon after that he got murdered and I when they let me know about the bad news they called me my house in Las Vegas I was living at the time and they told me about it and I just I couldn't believe it I I, I was like oh come on I just couldn't believe it I couldn't swallow it and later it hit me that it was real it was he was gone I really feel that Ernie uh, owes his Place where he's at in life right now to Rocky's training and discipline and, and to start. Together we, we, we uh, started my career back on track and now he's gone. When things are going well, now there's another downfall. But I started thinking of all the beautiful things that he taught me. And with God, I managed to get through that hard time and uh, came to El Paso and we buried him and said goodbye to him. But he always lives in my heart and in my memory. And I always say this, isn't it beautiful when someone is gone, but yet they live on, their legacy lives on. Russ Bradbird uh, is one of a kind. She's the world, one of the world's greatest dribblers. Russ Bradbird is the hub of a wheel down here in the Southwest. He's, he's got this incredible reputation as this ball handling wizard and teacher, renowned teacher of children, really. We wanted to start a basketball camp back in the early 80s after he started the mini dribbler program. Kids seven to 10 years old, they come in as seven years old as a freshman. They stay when they're eight, nine, 10, and leave as seniors at 10 years old. They do globetrotter tricks at halftime basketball games. They just knock the crowd out. People go crazy when they see these little kids doing all the tricks. So we had this camp thing going. We were making thousands of dollars, charging kids 200 bucks a week. We worked for Coach Don Haskins here at University of Texas at El Paso. People were coming from all over the state of Texas and New Mexico and Arizona to be taught by Brad Bird. Made a lot of money. So he came to me after we did this for a year or two and didn't feel comfortable with it. There were too many other camps charging 200 bucks around the nation. Russ really got involved with Rocky and his legacy after his death. He once called me and, and talked uh, many things about how he, we could do some things to help Rocky continue to, to grow in this community. And then Russ came to me and said, I don't like this. I'm teaching kids and charging them money. And there's kids in El Paso that can't afford to come to my camp. I want to help those kids instead. UTEP, all well, the local colleges and universities, they all have their camps that cost 200 bucks. Let the, let the kids that can afford them go to those camps, but let's get down to the barrio and help the kids that need some help. So we went to the barrio, we charged each kid one dollar. And that's where the basketball in the barrio camp was born. Yeah. 
we're deep in the heart of Bui Fair country. And this morning, uh, and it's good to see that basketball is alive and well in the barrio. Every year, all these people get together and they go down to the Segunda Barrio and they put together this camp. It's mostly kids from the Barrio, but they bring kids from, from all their other parts of El Paso. So, they, so you have this incredible mixture of, of economic classes, of these kids doing things together and playing. And it's, a, it's not only about basketball, of course. If you're there for any length of time, you know it's not about basketball. Basketball is sort of like a scam. The real thing is about culture. Our camp certainly is more unique and more special. We change things every seven minutes. We'll drill the kids with the basketball drill between the legs, spin the ball on the finger for seven minutes, and then boom, we're off to hearing a story. It's Joe Hayes from Santa Fe, the world famous storyteller. Children see so much highly produced entertainment, television, video games, movies, that they have no interest in listening to stories. And that when you tell children stories, you realize that is not true. Children still enjoy listening to stories. It's, it's an immensely satisfying experience for them. Nothing happened. And then Jose figured out what the problem was. You know what the problem was? The man couldn't speak Spanish, but it wasn't a big problem because Jose could speak two languages. He could speak Spanish and English. Only you kids know how to speak two languages. It's wonderful to use a, a sport like basketball and, and uh, uh, focus on that interest that the children have in the, in the physical activity and then really stimulate their minds with introductions to different types of artists, different types of thinkers, different important figures from the neighborhood. We have one more guest that I want to introduce to you. He grew up in this neighborhood and he dreamed, he loved El Paso. He could have gone to a lot of different places and he stayed in El Paso and eventually he became mayor of El Paso. And we're really, we're really lucky today. He grew up here, he had a dream of what he wanted El Paso to be. He wanted El Paso to be the greatest city in the world. And he dreamed about El Paso and how he wanted El Paso to be. And so he's come here today to talk to us. Let's give a big hand for Mayor Ray Caballero. Basketball, uh, an individual game or a team game? Team. That's right. Everything is teamwork, right? We have to learn how to play as a team, how to make sure that our team gets to go to the right place. Sometimes you've got to give the ball to somebody else on the team, don't you? Take a shot. So it is for the city. We are a great team. 
and we all need to be working. Everybody has a job to do. Greg Foster comes every year and says hello to the kids and gives wonderful stories about his days in the NBA, Garden Shack. We just have wonderful guests and lecturers that these kids otherwise would never meet. Nolan Richardson was here today. And Coach Nolan Richardson, one of El Paso's favorite sons of all time, comes in to camp unannounced. He says, I want to talk to your kids in the barrio. I grew up here. Nolan says, I grew up here. I want to talk to these kids. And uh, in fact, he did. He grew up in that neighborhood two blocks from our gym. And uh, he's been the only coach in history to win a junior college championship, an NIT championship, and the NCAA championship. And uh, he is El Paso born and bred, and he's proud of it. Born and raised here in El Paso, Texas. Uh, went to school here, University of Texas at El Paso. Uh, always idolized Coach Haskins and his basketball teams. Next thing you know, I end up coaching with him. He gave me the opportunity to do everything I could regarding basketball and coaching a basketball team at the college level. For, for a young Hispanic kid in El Paso, Texas, you grow up with UTEP basketball. So you take UTEP basketball down to South El Paso, the kids are going to know it. They're going to be, they're, they're, they have a relationship with it. They know about it. They know Coach Haskins. They know the names. Everybody does. Coach Haskins was able to go out there and touch the community. And he still does. I got his name. Okay, yeah. Mr. Haskins. Thank you a lot. You go. It was a pleasure hey, good, hey, hey, good luck. I've been to hundreds, thousands of basketball camps all around the United States, as a matter of fact. And if you walked in the Armijo Center, you step your foot in there, you're going to see something entirely different. That's what makes it so special. The dollar that we charge for basketball in the barrio is not about the, the free books from Cinco Puntos Press or the ice cream or the t-shirts, the basketballs we give to the kids. The dollar is really about this incredible cross-section of culture that we expose the kids to. Yeah, uh, some people say we joke around back at the camp that basketball in the barrio is the center of the universe and everybody wants to come here to share and to learn regardless of age or your background. You don't have to be a basketball player. You don't have to be a, um, a great coach, an incredible coach, or even a coach at all. You just want to be, be able to care for the kids and teach them the fundamentals of life, humanity, and basketball. I was approached by Russ uh, to do a mural dealing with Rocky Galarza. Although he was typical of a lot of people that I grew up with, he stands out. And in the way he stands out, by helping children. As I read about his history, he becomes more and more your superhero in a very unselfish way. And uh, the mural itself deals with his career in training boxers basketball players and he was good at a number of sports including baseball and uh, I've seen his yearbook at Bowie High School and uh, he was quite popular. I would consider Rocky as, as like anybody that I admire as a complex human being. He had sort of a understanding of, of trying to achieve something for himself and I think Rocky was able to give something to generations for a long time to come. I mean, just for the sense that he was able to excite Russ to, to put together this basketball camp and to name the basketball camp after him. I mean, that's, I mean, that's an incredible thing to have, to have achieved. A beautiful thing for me, I'm, I'm being blessed right now. It's me that's being blessed. 
and it's just an honor for me to be here and and come and back to the community and talk to the kids and be part of a great thing that uh, through Rocky and Russ Bradford, you know, and gang, Steve Yalen has started. Think of all the things that when different people merge in a city like this, what they bring with them, different values, different religions, different cultures, different music, different tastes, and this all comes together at the Basketball in the Barrio camp. I met Coach Bragbird from the coach Lou Henson. Uh, he's the coach of the New Mexico State Aggies. I met him at the camp for Pistoleros. He taught me a lot. The idea, the reason we bring Amanda is, if she can, if she can do it, then you can do it. I'm going to show you now one of my former dribblers, who I think is the best dribbler in the whole world for her for her age. The thing I like most about basketball is probably dribbling, because I, it's it's so fun and I, I like to shoot. Spider. I, I didn't know what that was until I met Russ. Two balls. I didn't know anything about. I could. I couldn't drill with my left hand. The first time I saw Russ dribble, he was awesome. He just blew me away. It was so cool. I wanted to be just like him, so I tried and tried, and I practiced every day, three hours a day when I was little. Now I just do it two hours. Kind of get tired. He show us like some routines that we do. We had to memorize them. And I'd, pra I'd go home and practice at my house. And I came back, I'd be better than I was in it the yesterday, day before. We've got great people, incredible people coming in from all places and walks of life all over the country. Uh, Debbie Weinreich, a European pro player in the Women's Pro Leagues of Europe. And Mike James, Athletes United for Peace. You know, Doug Harris. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, I want everybody to remember that. Okay, who's heading the Athletes United for Peace out on the West Coast in California. Great people, important people. We have David Megacy, who works as one of the directors of the NFL Players Association, flew in here from St. Louis after a meeting with the Rams. I mean, certainly he has more important things to do, you would think, but no, he thinks I gotta come and help Coach Russ out at Basketball in the Barrio. Russ Bradbird is a good friend of Michael James, who had put together the Heartland Cafe and uh, the Heartland Journal and the Heartland General Store, and uh, has put together uh, a number of athletic events under the uh, Athletes United for Peace banner, fun runs where he uh, uh, does road races and have people uh, 5K road races, street sprints, um, where he'll have people come in and have a good, good, good run and then come to the Heartland for a, a good breakfast. And Russ and Mike were good friends. And um, so Mike uh, told me about the camp and um, Russ got a hold of me to ask me if I'd be interested in coming to the camp. And uh, so that's how it started. It's been eight years for me. The reunion point of basketball in the body was very important. Uh, and that all these people are coming back that don't, we might not necessarily see for the rest of the year, uh, but they keep coming back. And I think it's because of Russ Bradbird and just the kind of caliber of person and coach in general that Russ Bradbird is. It keeps bringing all these uh, just diverse people, different viewpoints. Um, and we all work together towards trying to make this camp a success. 
Basketball in the Barrio is now under the under the umbrella of a, a group called Athletes United for Peace. Athletes United for Peace goes all around the world doing track meets and uh, midnight basketball and those kinds of things. The president of Athletes United for Peace... And basketball in the Barrio was a natural fit for uh, Athletes United for Peace because our executive director, Doug Harris, has been doing a number of basketball camps, clinics, and tournaments in the Bay Area over the last 15 years. Being a person with a extensive basketball background, the closest thing that I can compare to basketball in the Barrio is the Richmond Overnight Basketball Camp, which our organization, Athletes United for Peace, has ran for eight years. And this program connects young people to law enforcement in uh, the city of Richmond, which is currently one of the most dangerous and violent uh, cities in the entire United States. We saw that, that basketball in the barrio was an, a wonderful example of what the mission of Athletes United for Peace was about. And so we, uh, we talked to Russ and we talked to Steve Yellen, who is, uh, is Russ's friend and organizer of basketball in the barrio, and we, and we asked them if they would be interested in becoming uh, uh, the El Paso chapter of Athletes United for Peace. Uh, they agreed. It was uh, our two missions, if you will, were uh, almost identical. And so now uh, Basketball in the Barrio is uh, in some sense a production of Athletes United for Peace. And um, it's just another part, uh, another chapter in the country that, uh, that is, uh, is keeping that vision of what sports can be alive. I saw Dave Megacy, who's the West Coast Director of the NFL Players Association, on ESPN. And when I saw that, I said to myself, I have to interview this guy. Who is this guy? Because he was articulate and he was sharp and he didn't pull any punches. And I was like, this is exactly the kind of person I should be talking to. In talking about Dave Zirin, he is, in my mind, uh, an extension uh, of, of a tradition. And he's a young man. and. Uh, as uh, Bob Lipsight, uh, who is one of the foremost uh, sports journalists in the United States, has uh, called Dave, uh, you know, our best young sports journalist in the country. Honestly, I looked him up on the web and found his email, like through AUP, through Athletes United for Peace, and I sent him an email and I said, I I'd like to interview you and talk about your experiences around the anti-war movement in the '60s and you know, um, why you quit the NFL, just all that stuff. And what surprised me was Dave's response was I expected him to say something like, what a lot of people who are big, you know, what they do is they say, email me the questions and I'll answer them, which usually means their assistant answers them. Zyron is definitely in league with the tradition of what I call progressive people in sport who want to see sport in the spirit of Athletes United for Peace, that uh, sport is a way to bring people together, it's a way to bring communities together legitimately. What David did was he said, come on down to the NFLPA office and let's talk face to face. And I just had just tremendous respect for that, you know, that he was like, oh, this guy cares about the past and politics and history, and he's a young guy, therefore, by default, he's somebody I want to talk to. So I did this interview with Dave and it got around a lot. It was very well received. It's in my book, What's My Name, Fool? I and mean, I couldn't imagine a book without that interview with Dave Megacy because it really was so influential on the whole thinking around doing the book. And um, Dave, literally, probably the second time we were talking, said to me, hey, have you ever heard of basketball in the barrio? And I said, what are you talking about? Basketball in the barrio, what does that mean? And he said to me, it's something we do every year in El Paso. And to me, El Paso, you might as well be talking about Tierra del Fuego. I've never been south of like Fredericksburg, Virginia. So it was just sort of like a very foreign concept. And just, you know, and then I, I, Russ started emailing me, Russ Bradbird. And we just started talking a lot over email and a couple of times on the phone. And the more I talked to him, the more this seemed like a place that I should be for a lot of reasons. I mean, one, I think, Working with children is, is incredibly important. I taught first grade and third grade in Washington, D.C. for four years. And two, I really wanted to see for myself if the kids would respond to a kind of like progressive sports atmosphere.
Newly published book will be on the New York Times bestseller list for sure. David Zirin, welcome David Zirin. David, stand up. Oh, he, he's over <laughs> David's published on the internet daily with it, uh, an article called uh, The Edge of Sports. Please read his books. Thank you, David Zirin. The camp is a pilgrimage for a number of us. Uh, it happens every year in June, and there are people from uh, all over the country. The first thing I want to say is Russ is the only guy that was there for me and gave me the opportunity to, you know, play professional basketball, and I really appreciate that. He turned my life around, and he still... He coached in Ireland a couple of, uh, last couple of years and uh, did well over there as a coach. We are here to celebrate... IBA National Champions 2004 Tralee, Russ Bradford. Please, ladies and gentlemen, Coach Russ Bradford. It's easy to forget all the things that Russ is involved with and does, and of course he's an author of his book, Patty on the Hardwood, uh, based on his two years of coaching uh, uh, professional basketball in Ireland, uh, where he went to study uh, Irish fiddling. Uh, Russ is an incredibly accomplished uh, bluegrass fiddler and now an Irish fiddler. He's also gone to the Memphis Grizzlies uh, a training camp to uh, give instruction to the professional NBA uh, players on, on how to dribble a basketball or to better dribble a basketball. He's teaching uh, English right now at New Mexico State, so wh what can he do? Russ has been writing, I think he's developed as a writer, that's a part of his personality that's really developed. Like he motivates the kids at Basketball in the Barrio, he also motivates those around him, so I could count myself as one of those people. It's like, uh, what is he doing right now? He's working for this camp, trying to help kids out. Uh, he's, he's done that for years, uh, wherever he's been. And he loves it. He loves being around kids. I play basketball for the um, UTEP women's team. This camp is definitely different than any other camp uh, I've been involved in over my years of playing basketball. A lot of the, the kids that are at the camp today, and you notice the ones that have on the red shirts. Now you gotta remember, they were the guys in the yellow shirts a few years ago, okay? They were, they were small. I remember a lot of them being really small, and, and I worked with them, and Russ worked with them over the years, over their ball handling skills, and they graduated. And Russ just promoted them, you know, like to red shirt, and honestly, they're doing like a better job than we are. You know, because they know exactly what they're doing, but that came over years of, of consistency of coming to the camp. So the red shirts are pretty much, they're the trainers. They're the ones that, that's running the camp. They know exactly what they're doing. They get to the stations. They don't ask any questions. One little guy, one Sean, uh, he, just, he just takes over. You know, I'm supposed to be the coach, right? And Sean is like, all right, everybody get in a circle, get a ball, we're going to start with figure eight. You know, and he just run in the camp, just run in the camp. And that's just from years of being with Russ. Right, guys, we're going to go around our waist, okay? Hand to hand. Hand to hand. Ready? One, two. Round your waist. I went to basketball camp every summer um, from the ages of 13 to 16. Let me tell you what it was. Two and a half hours of basketball, lunch. Two and a half hours of basketball, film. Two and a half hours of basketball, sleep. That to, to my parents was like good training. You need that, you know? Do layups all day or shoot 100 three pointers until we make 50 of them. You know, those are the camps that I went to when I was coming up, when I went to camp. Oh, no, it was no storytelling. They weren't telling us no stories and talking about art. No, juice, cookies, come on. I feel like stories, for one thing, they really stimulate kids' minds and it makes better readers out of them and makes them more, more interested in, in yeah, literature. And also, uh, there's something about stories that kind of draw kids in and, uh, and kind of pull kids close to you. And just, just the way, I guess, kids are drawn to a, a coach. And, in 2004, baseball fans rebelled against the placing of movie ads on Major League bases, while a number of athletes challenged the limits of 
on what they are supposed to think and say. The round mound of, of sound, Charles Barkley spoke his mind about the war in Iraq and, and a number of all the of cultural things that happened truths. in the camp. In my mind, it's an antidote to the TV culture that most kids get, and that's the information that they get, that does not talk about their culture. We want to stop violence, we want to promote peace, and to do that we have peace posters. Now I'm going to go through what these posters are, you will get to choose one. After we go over the poster, I want you to give a round of applause if you think it's a poster that you might want to have. That's how we're going to do it. The first poster, Carlos Santana. Does anybody know who Carlos Santana is? Yes, sir. Yeah. That is correct. Yeah. He is a guitar player, and this is a Carlos Santana with a peace sign, and this is a quote by Carlos Santana, and this is what he says. Life is for living, so why must we wait? We all need some loving, so then why do we hate? And this is the poster. Clap your hands for the poster. And it's Carlos Santana. Next poster is of Roberto Clemente. Anybody know who that is? Roberto Clemente. Anybody know who Roberto Clemente is? This is a baseball player. All right, raise your hand on this one. Is he alive? Is he alive or is he not alive anymore? Now, yes, he played for the Pirates. Very good. And he died in a plane trying to bring food and medicine to people who were hurt by a hurricane. So he really did die a selfless death, and he died a hero to many people. Now, Roberto Clemente, this is his quote, and I'll show you this. He said, anytime you have an opportunity to make things better and you don't, then you are wasting your time on earth. And this is Roberto Clemente. <laughs> Died trying to make the world a better place. Uh, Zyron is a, a tremendous sports writer. When he came down to basketball in the barrio, uh, I think his mind was blown because he had been through basketball camps himself, and this was something that he had never seen about how you could put together a camp that really would have a positive impact on, on people's lives apart from teaching them uh, uh, the rudiments of uh, playing basketball. I talked to one of the kids today, an incredible, incredible 10-year-old um, girl named Amber, Amber Avia. And what Amber said to me was, she said, um, I love basketball, but basketball is just a game, and it's not just about me and what I love. It's about something that can be here for all these kids. But she also has an understanding that, you know, basketball is not the be all end all of life. And I think that's very important for kids to understand because let's face it, you're growing up in the body, a lot of times you're sold a bill of goods that the only way out is through pro sports. And kids have more of a chance of going to Vegas and being dealt a royal straight flush than being a professional millionaire athlete. The odds are just insane. And that doesn't mean kids shouldn't try, but it means that um, kids have to know that there are options. There's more of a connection between sports and arts than, than uh, we acknowledge most of the time. And I, I think a program like this really, really emphasizes that. But it's also a celebration of the city of El Paso and especially a celebration of, of this neighborhood in this area, the richness of the culture in this part of the city of El Paso. It's amazing all the different uh, ideas and presentations uh, that, that they bring into this camp. Who knows who the Wawa pedal is? This is the first Wawa Wild Wild ever. Who knows what an amplifier is? This is the first amplifier ever. This is a resonator. It's a cord. See, anytime you put a hollow body around a vibration, if it's created either by your mouth or by a stick or by your hand or whatever, it amplifies the sound. And this was the very first amplifier, see? It just, so pretty soon, the guy here was making more noise. Now who knows what a woodwind is? Woodwind are things like saxophones, flutes, bassoon, oboe, all of those are woodwinds. So, you want to see one of the first woodwind instruments ever? Yeah. It was just a big piece of bamboo, right? It's a bamboo, and I made it into a flute. Now, 
You know what I did? I planted this bamboo before you were born, 15 years ago. And I cut it down last year. David is a witness. I cut it down last year and I made it into this fruit. See? And this is the first, one of the very first woodwind instruments ever. I have to be honest with you, being at the camp this year, it's exceeded my every expectation, without question. It's been one of the great moving experiences of my young life to be here. Um, I wouldn't trade this weekend for anything. I'll be back next year and I'm going to bring my wife and my baby. Because frankly, this is the kind of atmosphere I want my baby to be around too. Russ Bradbird and Steve Yellen, uh, kind of like uh, brothers. Two guys that could be referred to as native to El Paso more so, I think, than many uh, native El Pasoans. I mean, both are involved in so much good for this community. And again, I use this word a lot, and it's a word I really believe in. Both have passion for this community. Both have embraced this community and its culture and its heritage and its traditions. And I think uh, because of it, uh, this city and this area and its citizens uh, are all the better for it. And, you know, there are, there are individuals who have been important in that aspect of sports. You know, Rocky Galarza, Don Haskins, you know, the Nolan, the Nolan Richardson, uh, Russ Bradbird, all these people contributing to, I think, a very, uh, in some sense, kind of almost a unique vision of, of sport and what it could be about. And, and uh, uh, as the saying goes, a lot of these folks didn't, weren't born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Oh, also, so there's a long history here because of Rocky Galarza, and two guys are carrying on that tradition for us still, still today. Old Bowie High School classmates, Super Sanchez and Javier Diaz. I was just thinking about it today when I was sitting there, and I was thinking, you know, this is almost impossible to really comprehend. I can see the hard work of all these volunteers and everybody willing to help, and. I cannot even imagine, you know, why these people coming from way back in California just to help out. And we had several, some from, from Chicago, and uh, you know, it's, it's uh, this type of people, they're going to make this thing probably one of the best camps in America. Uh, one of the traditions that we continue in the, in the barrio here is to try and get viewer out or younger people to continue with the history of what has happened here so it will not be forgotten. The camp is our way of remembering Rocky Galarza who, did, who trained kids for free for 30 years. And he didn't care how tall they were, or how talented they were, or anything else. He just he trained everyone the same. He was the world's most democratic coach. Everyone was the same to Rocky Galarza. And so I, I think Rocky would be really proud of us. So let's sort of hear from Rocky Galarza. Rusty's, he's to me, is a blessing that came around at the right time to keep a legend like Rocky alive. It's just, uh, uh, my hat's off to, to Russ because there's, you know, you have to have people that can continue to, to, to keep, it, keep it going. Uh, then Rocky is dying is not in vain. And it's a beautiful thing because Rocky lives. Rocky lives. Yeah. <laughs>